When your Credit Valley was first asked to undertake the uh, planning of this uh, conference, had a conversation with the Archbishop um, and the College of Bishops, and we thought we would invite a guest speaker, uh, a friend of mine from uh, the U.S., uh, to speak about an entirely different topic. And then we went away as bishops in December, and we had a conversation about where we think the future of the diocese might be going, where we think the future of parishes might be going. We did a little mapping exercise, and we put all of the parishes on across this vast diocese of ours. And we tried to make some determination about where we thought things might be going. And by the end of that, uh, two things uh, happened. First, we're very encouraged uh, by, the, uh, by uh, so much that's going on in the life of the diocese. God is good. God is always good, and this is a great time to be church. It's also clear that we're going to be going through a time of significant pruning, which we have already been involved in. And so we decided at the end of that retreat that the smartest thing for us to do would be to work together with the uh, clergy of the Diocese of Toronto and to try to spend this time talking a bit about what we think the future might look like. And so we've called the conference Shaping Our Future Together. We hope over the next couple of days to share with you as bishops what we think the direction may be, some of the challenges, exciting opportunities and concerns, and we hope to hear from you some of the same. So that I hope, my hope for the end of this conference is when you go back to your deaneries and to your parishes, you might be energized to think about how can we do this in a different way, in a more creative way? What, in what, way, what is God calling us to do in our area? What context are we worshiping in? How do we, um, uh, how do we seek to be, continue to be, to be faithful to the gospel to which we are being called? And so um, at this particular session, um, the Archbishop and I will be, uh, will be leading it. Uh, it'll be a lot of background that I think you're familiar with, but I think it will help to put uh, the next couple of days uh, in context for us. So uh, I think I will call upon the Archbishop, um, and as he's walking down, we don't very often get a chance to say thank you to our leader. I don't quite want to go hail the chief, but I want to say, uh, <laughs> Colin, we really appreciate your leadership in our midst. Thank you so much. Uh, it's always useful to go first, because then you can steal the next person's thunder. And since uh, Philip uh, did the first half page of my notes, <laughs> I'd like to, uh, to welcome all of you to, the, uh, to this clergy conference. For how many people is it the first time they've been to a uh, diocesan clergy conference? Look at that. You know, what, 20%? And uh, I'd like to uh, introduce those who are newly ordained deacons, uh, if, if they could just stand up. Okay. How many people are new to the diocese in the last two years? Okay, would you just stand up too? Welcome. Now, one of the things about clergy conferences is that this Psalm 127 actually says it. It is vain that you rise so early and go to bed so late. <laughs> vain, too, to eat the bread of toil, for he gives his beloved sleep. Well, that's not usually what a clergy conference is about, in my experience, but uh, perhaps for some of you, it might be a time of some rest and, and relaxation, because we want to take some time to away from the usual things in in your parish life, um, time for some rest, for conversation, for meeting one another. There will be a particular time tomorrow where you will have the opportunity to go and do a whole variety of different things. Um, and also time for us to discuss together what we think the future of the church is about, shaping our future together. And. I think that the word together is a, a critically important one. Again, I want to thank Philip and the, the uh, 
team of regional deans and others who have, have brought this uh, organization together for this. There are a number of people who aren't here, one of whom is Patrick Yu, the Bishop of uh, York Scarborough, and there is a reason. He fell off a ladder, tore all of the ligaments of his knee, and broke his ankle. There are some people who do anything to get out of a conference. <laughs> But there are other people here who really, who are not here, who also stand in need of your prayers today. And uh, so I do commend a variety of people to your prayers. Um, uh, some people are here because they've chosen not to be, but most are not here because they are ill or there's a, a crisis within the life of their parish. There are a few people who are not here because they're celebrating. And those are some graduating uh, students from Wycliffe College who are uh, convocating tonight. And our prayers are with them as they move into the next stage of their, their ministry. I'd like you to begin with prayer. Draw your church together, O Lord, into one great company of disciples, together following our Lord Jesus Christ into every walk of life, together serving him in his mission to the world, and together witnessing to his love on every continent and island. We ask this in his name and for his sake. Amen. That prayer was uh, penned by... Um, the primate Canada at the time, Archbishop Clark, uh, as uh, we began what was known as the uh, Anglican Congress in Toronto in 1963. It was at that Congress that the term MRI, Mutual Responsibility and Interdependence, was coined and became a watchword for the Anglican Communion and our unfolding relationships with one another that sense of mutual responsibility, of interdependence, became a hallmark of our communion and has reverberated down through the, the 50 years since that. We are in the midst of, and thank God, nearly completed the Our Faith, Our Hope campaign. Um, those of you who are still in the midst of it, um, I'm very thankful. For those of you who have completed, I am even more thankful. Uh, but one of the things that was outlined in the Our Faith, Our Hope campaign were a series of, of commitments that we were making looking to the future of our church. Because I believe that we are really on the cusp of something really quite exciting and creative, although very frightening too. I've understood by the grapevine that there's a little prison of anxiety out there, that uh, there are some wondering uh, if we're going to announce uh, over this, the next couple days that your church is going to be closed uh, or that you're going to be moving or something like that. Uh, let me put that to rest. That's not what's going to happen. What is going to happen is looking at what the future is going to be, what, uh, uh, regaining a renewed sense of vision and hope. The Our Faith, Our Hope campaign was well named. It's about faith and it is about hope. It's about development of leadership and so this conference will be about leadership development and what the needs for leadership might be and how we might resource that. It's about building communities uh, and, and planting new churches in new ways, in new places. It's about communicating the gospel in new ways. It is about reimagining how our buildings, the heritage that we have received, can be readapted and reshaped for mission in the 21st century. And it's about how we can build up teams of people, particularly in some 
key parishes, which can reach out in new ways into a wider community around them. And I want to explore a little bit about that over the next few days. We've been talking about how clergy can work together in teams, and so many of us have been trained to be lone rangers, to be the key leader in a parish, and that those who function as associates are, are either part-time or they might be failed incumbents or not quite sure that they can devote the time to be incumbents. And what we really need today for the future is to build teams where we have A-team players in all of those roles working together in uh, the same parish over or linked to other parishes in a team. Where everybody is competent. We'll talk more about that later. We're going to begin a conversation about the shape of our church over the next 10 years. And you're part of the invitation into that conversation. Leadership is not about somebody at the top saying how it is, but all of us together working out what the future might be and how it will unfold. We're needing to listen and discern and wonder, what is the Holy Spirit doing at this time? What is the Holy Spirit leading us into? What is the Holy Spirit trying to teach us? Wondering what it's all about. And so it's a time not for definitive answers, but a time to explore in that sort of wondering, what if the Holy Spirit were leading us in this direction? What would it look like? And how might I respond? Each of you is a leader. I expect each of you to be a leader. But what will be required of leadership in the 21st century? What do these changing times mean for leadership? What are we going to, how are we going to exercise that and how are we going to equip ourselves to be those types of leaders? And partway through this conference, we will have uh, a session on adaptive leadership. Finally, I want to say this is God's church. So relax. It's God's church. Let the Holy Spirit breathe and work in us. This conference is going to be rooted in prayer and in the study of Scripture. And that's one of the primary conversations, the conversation with God and the conversation with our tradition, as well as the conversation with each other. What has God been doing? What is God continuing to do? And what will God do into the future? We have a core mission. And that mission is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, who is able to transform individuals and transform cultures and transform the world. We need to form disciples of Jesus Christ. We need to plant new churches, new communities where faithful people can gather to worship, to grow, to learn, and to move back out in mission. It's our vocation, our call from God at this particular moment in time. It's an exciting period of time, a time that is challenging, but then it would be boring if it wasn't challenging, wouldn't it? There's nothing new that you're going to hear today, I think, or this week. Nothing new. But then the gospel is always new, even though it's very old. It always says new things to us, touches us in new ways, opens us to new leadings and promptings by the Spirit. To 
today I want you to listen, to pray, to read, to talk, to discern, and to rest in God's presence. This is a very short clip that maybe will work. This comes from uh, What Is God Doing? And it's just, just a brief clip that picks up from something that I said in, a, in the first synod that I led when I said that we needed to do some pruning of our churches. And then that got developed into pruning for growth. And then that got developed into reaching out in new ways. And then that image got picked up by somebody in one of our Andaba groups about keys of a car or something like that. At Synod two years ago, we had a, a, a large discussion about uh, fresh expressions of church. And the question came out of one of the sessions, uh, do we have permission to drive the family car? Are we limited in that? And I said, you have the keys to the car. Drive the car. Try something new. Just don't wreck it. And uh, people laughed at that, but in fact, I think some people have actually tried to drive the family car. And I think like driving a family car, several things are happening. One is that some people are just driving up and down the same strip, going from one stoplight to the next. Other people are um, going to some new destinations, and other people are picking people up and bringing them home. So. Uh, I think the image is actually a good image about a mixed economy church. Different things are going to happen with different people. And uh, I think it's really exciting. When I was uh, living in the city of, of Peterborough, I uh, can only recall one person who had an accent other than a British Isles accent. That accent was German, and the woman was our housekeeper. She did uh, cleaning, coming in once every week or so uh, to clean out the rectory. And I have to say, with three kids, it needed a lot of cleaning. Um, I can recall in those days in uh, Peterborough, um, Evensong. People flocked to Evensong. I grew up singing in a men and boys choir, men and boys choir. Uh, we finally allowed a women's choir um, in the early 60s, but they sang the earlier service. The men and boys sang at 11 o'clock, the divine hour of worship, and back again Sunday night at 7 o'clock, and two rehearsals, Tuesday and Friday. Now, can you imagine a group of kids doing that this, these days? Unbelievable. A 65 men and boys choir. There were Bible studies. They talked about uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of men gathering together for Bible study as part. Uh, and, and what I remember is that the church actually was the social center of the community. It was in Peterborough, the Church Hockey League. I think it's still called the Church Hockey League, actually. And when all saints would routinely beat Sacred Heart, I'm pleased to be able to tell you that happened. Our uh, baseball team was also sponsored by the local church. Most of our activities actually centered around the church. The 23rd Cub Pack uh, met in the parish hall uh, in, uh, uh, at All Saints Peterborough. When we went to school, it was um, uh, enshrined in the Education Act that there would be two one-half-hour periods a week taught by a Protestant minister in what was referred to as the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, and they would come in and teach us. Now, in my case, it was my father, so it wasn't the most riveting uh, two uh, uh, periods a week, I must say. But it was, uh, uh, it was just expected. And in fact, there were very few voices that criticized the church. Any time a public building was opened, the, the local priest would be there. Anytime there was a major event in the city of Toronto, the Bishop of Toronto, the Lord Bishop of Toronto, would be there. The news media would uh, ask the local, the bishop, if you go back and read a history of Globe and Mail and the old Toronto Telegram and stuff, the 30s and 40s and 50s, you'll see that the bishop was asked for his opinion on major issues of the day. And they got the titles right and they spelled the names right. 
In those days, there was a lot of institutional support. You'll remember that it was this church that launched the public school system. It's the church that launched the health care system, the hospitals. Um, it's, it was interesting as the Archbishop and I were visiting in India, visiting particularly in South Kerala and north, uh, north part of, of India and Delhi, we were particularly struck by the number of institutions attached to local parishes. There was inevitably an elementary school, a high school, a university. There were schools for what they called the deaf and the dumb, their language. Schools that they called meant for the mentally retarded, their language. Um, but all of this was part of and centered around and focused around the church. I stand to be corrected, but in the Anglican tradition, with the possible exception of St. John's Rehab Hospital, I can't think of an institution that's still connected to us. So we don't have that institutional support now that we did 50, 70, 90, 100 years ago. We find ourselves living in a time fairly obvious uh, where people have a significant distrust of things religious. Or um, I'm, I, I'm reading a fascinating book. I'm only halfway through, so if some of you have finished it can uh, tell me the end of it. That would be great. Dorothy Butler Bath, uh, Christianity After Religion. Very interesting questions uh, that she raises in that book as she's uh, trying to help me understand what it means when people say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And I have to say, until I read this book, I was sick and tired of hearing that question. I thought it meant that people had very little interest in going deep in spirituality. So they say, oh, I'm sort of spiritual, but I'm not religious. That they didn't like uh, institutional religion. They didn't like the church. And of course, there has been lots of reason for that to have unfolded over the last 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. Uh, very much, uh, very often, the popular um, message that goes out is one that's anti-institution. Now, I have to say, it's not just the church that finds itself in this boat. Uh, the political uh, situation in which we live is very much like that. We don't trust our politicians, the people that actually lead our country. Enormously important job um, to, uh, to offer yourself as a civil servant uh, to your country. But we don't trust that. We don't trust our leaders in education. We don't trust... Uh, remember when, um, when um, uh, Osama bin Laden was um, reported to have been um, assassinated, instantly people said, no, that didn't happen. Do you remember? Instantly they said that. And then Obama would say, show us the pictures. You've got to show us the pictures. We won't believe until we see the pictures. And Obama wisely said no. And if he had shown the pictures, they would have said, oh, he photoshopped them. We don't trust our institutional leaders. And so it, and we also, I think, live in a, in a society these days that is, uh, I think Henry Nouwen referred to it as a house of fear. We're permeated by fear. We're permeated by the fear of, of, of the economy. I mean, any of us that have a stock portfolio that are fortunate enough to be among the few that have that must be a little worried. I heard on the trip in from Toronto today that we were down uh, three, uh, what do they call it, uh, over 100 points, whatever, three three something or other, three digit loss, whatever they call that. Every news media now opens up, every time I listen to the radio, it opens up with uh, whatever the TSE or Dow Jones is doing. There's a fear of uh, media, there's environmental fear, like I loved the last winter, but how did that happen? You know, there's a social fear, uh, there's people fear, there's the fear of those who are different. There's a kind of pervasive fear, Henry Nouwen says, we don't even recognize it. It's a very different context in which we are living today. And it's into that context, uh, uh, I should say that growing up in the city of Toronto was known as Toronto the Good. They used in those days the language of WASP. Toronto was WASP, remember that? White, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. We don't use that language anymore, but that was very much the language of today. Today, Toronto is the most multicultural city in the entire world. Today, the, uh, first, the language spoken by people, the mother tongue of the majority of its citizens is something other than English. And I rejoice in that. And it's moving not just the city of Toronto, but it's, it's changing the face of our entire diocese. 
As you know, I have some involvement with the International Anglican Communion. I'm very fond of saying that there are Anglicans in 165 countries in the world. 165 countries in the world. And they're coming to Toronto. They're coming to Toronto. But it's a very different situation than it was 50 or 60 years ago. So I want to say that by way of setting a little bit of context. Uh, I might just say that um, I have not worked in a rural situation, but I, growing up in Peterborough, spent a, quite a bit of time in places like Millbrook and Omimi and Fowler's Corners and, and places around there. My, my family had a, a background in Bob Cajun. And I know that life in the rural communities has changed significantly. In fact, in some ways, it's tough to say that there are rural communities anymore. People aren't generally dependent on growing their own food. They generally aren't dependent on making their own entertainment. They've generally got better access to communication, better access to travel, and so on and so forth. So it's a very different environment um, uh, from, from when I was, um, was a child. So it's into the culture and into the context that you and I are called to do our ministry, called to be engaged as uh, disciples of Jesus Christ, called to proclaim the good news. And there's lots of good news to proclaim. One of the, uh, uh, I want to begin by saying something, I'll, um, I want to do two things in the balance of my presentation. I want to share with you the strategic ministry policy of the Diocese of Toronto, and then I want to share with you some of the statistical information that we have, just a, a, a snippet of it. There's much more if you want it. Uh, you can get in touch uh, with me and I'd be happy to provide it. But I want to talk about the strategic ministry policy. In my time as a bishop, I have uh, been at the 50th anniversary celebrations um, more often than anything else I've done. Because in the 50s and 60s, we went across Etobicoke, we went across Scarborough, and we built churches. Uh, to uh, name one, the Church of St. Wilfred, where they petitioned the bishop because it was too far to walk from there to St. George's Islington um, on, the, um, on the one hand, and... Um, uh, St. Matthew's on the other. So they asked if St. Wilfred's could be built less than a mile apart. Less than a mile apart. And of course, as you know, uh, we have been, uh, uh, I have uh, been engaged in the closing and disestablishment of many churches that had their roots uh, in the 1950s. That was true in Mississauga, it's true in Etobicoke, it's been true in Scarborough. So I want to say something, uh, one of the things that guides us, how do we understand effective ministry? How do we understand strategic ministry in the life of the Diocese of Toronto? And it was uh, out of our um, congregational development folks that um, uh, uh, did some thinking about this sustainable and, and strategic ministry policy. And I want to share it with you because it's really helpful for us uh, to, um, to uh, look at parishes in this kind of light. Do I hit this button? Forward button. Forward button. That one? Oh, that was so cool. Can we do that again? <laughs> there, uh, uh, what, the line of, of across the kind of east-west line has to do with mission, and there's a north-south line that has to do with resources. So we're looking at the sense of, re of mission and looking at the sense of resources. On the plus side of the mission, parishes need to be able to articulate and demonstrate a vital ministry and a ministry that's appropriate in their context. So I want you to think about this. One of the things that I've learned as a bishop, that parishes that are inward-looking implode. It's absolutely guaranteed. Parishes that are inward-looking will implode. Um, that, and that's the negative side of the mission that there's no clear mission in their context. They're inward-looking, they're maintenance-focused. And you know, I, look, I grew up in an Anglican rectory that kept uh, the church kept open by its fingernails. I understand profoundly what it means to love a church building and profoundly what it means to not have the critical mass to be able to actually get some things accomplished. Um, to be able to do things. When one person leaves the parish, it can destroy the morale of the congregation. When one person dies, it can destroy the morale of the congregation as they just don't have the energy or capacity. And there are parishes that simply have no clear mission in their context. They're inward-looking. They're maintenance-focused. 
On the resource side, there are two types of parishes. One that have the resources, not just financial, but yes, financial, uh, the people, the buildings, the spiritual health, the money to carry out their mission. And you'll be able to think right off the top of your head of parishes in that kind of situation uh, because they're, in, and they're not just the largest parishes. That's, it's not about size particularly, but about the, having the resources, the people, the building, the spiritual health, and the money to carry out their mission. On the negative side of that, there is a lack of resources to carry out the mission. And I think the people capacity is one of the most important. Um, uh, there's just a certain critical mass that's important. Now, in the top right-hand corner, if you have the resources and if you are able to articulate and demonstrate a vital mission and ministry, we would say that parish is sustainable. They're going to be in good shape. In the event that you have no mission, that you're inward-looking, maintenance-focused, and you lack the resources to carry out the mission, those parishes are not sustainable. If you have a mission and are really clear about what it is you're trying to accomplish, but you don't happen to have the resources to, to accomplish it, those are the parishes we're calling strategic and we're willing to invest in. If there's a clear vision of ministry, we want to support that happening. And then there are those who have all kinds of resources but no clear mission, They're, and um, we believe that they are static. And generally speaking, we find that they're in decline. So that's a quick look at our sustainable and strategic ministry policy, uh, which has helped to guide uh, much of our thinking. Here's some statistical trends out of the last, uh, it's not quite accurate, 10 years, because I think the last, uh, uh, and some of these numbers go only go back to 2010, but it gives us a bit of a, a, bit of a look of where we've been. There are 235 parishes were analyzed in an overview of congregational performance between the years 2000 and 2009. 8% of the congregation have experienced catastrophic declines in that time. That means that over they are less than 50% of their size from uh, 10 years ago. 36 have experienced alarming levels of decline, which means that they are uh, three quarters of their size from 10 years ago. 39% have experienced a decline of less than 25%, and 17% have experienced numeric growth. We're told that the total average attendance declined 5,355 people from 28,605 to 23,250 in between the years 2000 and 2009. This chart uh, gives you a, uh, just a look at the um, uh, average Sunday attendance and Easter attendance. Easter attendance is the line at the top of the page and um, uh, the uh, average Sunday attendance uh, over the, uh, the year. You'll see that the decline, it's not been straight down and it's beginning actually to turn around. I want to say that. But you'll see that it's, that we've experienced some declines. So, the yeah. ten, hello? What's the source of these numbers? Parochial returns? Uh, they've been based on parochial returns. That's the evidence that we, uh, uh, that we have. Okay? So the 10 year statistics, um, in terms of human resources, and this might uh, be interesting to you, uh, we have seen a, a numerical decline of 30, of 30 positions, a 14% decrease in clergy. We've um, also, an uh, interesting chart is the retirement projections that are, are, um, we're taking a look at. Um, we're eligible to retire after 35 years or 65 years of age or whatever it is. Um, after the stock market, uh, some of us are going to hang on to Freedom 70, well, 83 maybe. Um, but in any event, I want to just say that there are enough retirements coming up in the next 10 years that um, we have, uh, can assure people that there are lots of jobs. We may, in fact, need to be bringing more people into the diocese to fill them. So it's not a question of whether there will be jobs available. I want to be clear about that. Uh, for good, faithful, competent, capable clergy, uh, we're going to have work. Uh, that's the way it's going to work out over, um, over the course of time. 
Um, that's uh, probably not a terrific chart for you to take a look at, but to, it gives an idea of the number of ordinations uh, that were estimated in 2011 and 12, and the number of full-time positions. Um, and you'll see that the, uh, uh, you get some idea of the number of people that are retiring. So that by 2021, 122 of us in this room will have been eligible to or will have retired. So a couple of things from the Nanots poll on religion in Canada. More than half Canadians in the 15 to 29 cohort have no religion or never attended a service of worship. I think that is an enormous possibility for us and that God has given us a tremendously fertile opportunity for us to, uh, uh, to reach out and engage in. That's not a negative, that's a positive. There are two generations at least of people with no Christian memory. Um, only 22% say that religion is very important to them. That's down from this asking the same secular question right across Canada um, of 34% and who said it, religion was important to them in 2002. Um, what growth there has been in religious parta uh, participation, uh, participation has been primarily due to immigration. Um, the Archbishop was in Quebec, and I shouldn't quote you, but I, I will, went to an 11 o'clock service in Quebec City at the cathedral, and there was 60 people. When I grew up in Quebec, I mean, Quebec was the heart of Roman Catholicism, and it was, uh, I understood it to be just uh, bursting with, um, with engagement in the life of the church. Um, so uh, this says, unfortunately for us, the current source countries for immigration are not predominantly Christian, and consequently not predominantly Anglican, but that is not to say that there are not Christians or Anglicans who are coming uh, to our country. So where is the growth taking place in the diocese of Toronto? Well, I'm sorry, let me get, just go to this one first. Where we have subsequent to this uh, chart thing put together, uh, we have begun a full-time ministry in the area of the Mandarin population. We're just underway with a new uh, piece of work in Ajax, We've had a couple of situations in downtown Toronto, particularly St. Anne's, uh, St. Paul's, and, um, and um, uh, St. George the Martyr uh, around sort of internal church plants. Um, there's been any number of intentional missional uh, renewal and re reboots. That's referring to uh, St. Anne's and St. George the Martyr. We're beginning to look at reclustering uh, hub parishes in places like Trent Durham. Uh, there's been uh, fresh expressions have been uh, uh, taking fire. Uh, the REACH grants have been um, uh, helping that to happen. And the uh, missional transformation process, we'd like to move from 14 parishes engaged in that uh, to 25 by the year 2013. So where's the growth? Okay, if you could see the geography around this, you would see that this area at the bottom is the 905 area of the city of Toronto. And the top is around um, places like uh, um, in uh, Lake Simcoe and uh, uh, George, uh, not Georgian Bay, but Lake Simcoe area, uh, in and around um, Aurelia and the places on, places underneath the south end of, of Simcoe. Um, that uh, I'm sorry that that's not working because it would be kind of neat to see it. The decline um, has. Um, um, I'm not sure why that's not coming. If you took a look at the decline numbers, before you read this, uh, the decline numbers um, were in the city of Toronto, the biggest one. When I was a kid, Eglinton Deanery was recognized as the big deanery. Uh, it's, it's had significant decline. York Mills Deanery had just seen significant numeric decline. So um, if we layer on the age cohort data, we see that there are 11 congregations that are terminal. Uh, there are 15 that are in significant danger um, and um, uh, with the age profiles of well over 65 as average Sunday attendance. This is where the declining... Whoop. That should have gone... That's all right. Don't worry about it. That's just what I was referring to a moment ago. Okay, so that's just a little bit of the um, uh, statistical background uh, that we're dealing with in terms of, uh, of the Diocese of Toronto. Um, we've got some challenges in front of us, but I believe that God has given us an enormous opportunity. Uh, those of you that know me know that I tend to be uh, either glass half full or, um, 
um, uh, overflowing kind of guy rather than a ha glass half empty kind of time. I think there are enormous challenges for us, but I think that God has given us all that we need to, to make this work for us, and, and more particularly to make it work uh, for God through Jesus Christ. So an exciting time. It's not the first time the church has had challenges. Uh, if you go back into uh, the history of our own diocese, you uh, will read about plagues that caused the church great problems. The uh, Irish immigration at one point caused the church great problems. Um, all kinds of situations. Um, I don't believe the Church of Jesus Christ is going anywhere any uh, uh, anytime soon. I, and I, uh, I believe that the Anglican Church has a contribution to make on that uh, Christian landscape. So uh, I think I'll leave it there, Your Grace, if I could uh, turn the microphone back to you. Thank you. One of the things that uh, Philip said is that, uh, that there are areas of growth and areas of decline. One of the areas of growth, interestingly, that he didn't point out were not only the 905 area, but St. James Deanery, right in the heart of downtown. Uh, so you get pockets here and there. And um, uh, interestingly, people who have migrated from the, the inner core of the city and are now, guess what they're doing? They're cottaging and going to church in Huronia deaneries um, around uh, Lake, Lake uh, Simcoe and Georgian Bay. This is not new. In some ways it's new, but it's, it's not new. We live organically. Um, David Harrison is doing a project right now looking at churches in the Diocese of Toronto that have closed over the last century. How many are there? That you've, I haven't you haven't counted yet. Well, I have a clue. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 churches that have opened, lived for a while, and closed. You know why? Because of a very simple but important factor. It's called death and resurrection. Have you heard of that? We shape ourselves around two large stories. Uh, and the story are incarnation and death and resurrection. The incarnation is about God being present in our midst. God coming into our presence, pitching his tent, calling us into relationship with himself, coming to be with his people, not absent or just simply overseeing them, but with his people. Incarnation is at the heart of our Christian story, that we are present with the people that God has called his own, and God is present with us. And the second is death and resurrection, that we are called to offer ourselves as Christ offered himself for the sake of the world, to sacrifice himself, to bring people back and to reconcile them back into relationship with God. The death is not the last word, it's always the penultimate word. The resurrection, God always calls us into a relationship with himself to give life. Should we be surprised that there's going to be some death? that some things have to be sacrificed, that some things have to be given up? I don't think so. I think that we are called to be people who live in our own lives the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That God is always calling new life out of the things that we thought were dead. And in fact, they were dead. Somebody once asked, I asked a, a priest, who actually happens to be sitting here today, if he would consider going to a new parish to help kickstart it. And he said, I said, the parish is just about dead. He said, do you mean it's just about dead or it is dead? Because he said, I'd be quite glad to go if it's dead. 
because there's hope. If it's just about dead, it will take a lot of work. <laughs> we live as a people of hope. I think that there are t the old dichotomies within the life of the church are much changed than what they used to be 50 years ago where the difference between high church and low church, conservative and liberal, were predominant. When I was ordained 35 years ago, in fact, two years before, there were different ordinations for those who went to Wycliffe and those who went to Trinity. <laughs> the difference today, I think, is not between high church and low church, liturgical and non-liturgical, those who follow a lectionary and those who do sermon series. I think the difference is how you view the future. Do you look at the future as with confidence that God is in charge, that God is giving and leading us into a future that is full of hope? Or do you despair and cocoon and turn inward, look to the past not as a source for moving into the future, but to look to the past with regret that it isn't that way anymore. I think we are called as leaders in the church not to despair, but to hope. To hope that the living God is still present in our midst that the living God still speaks to us in word and sacrament, that the living God still is part of us as we open ourselves in prayer, as we listen to the leading of the Spirit, as we are called together in community with imagination and courage. I think there's urgency to act. We cannot be complacent. God does not call us to be complacent or passive. But I think we need to look at the future not fearing, not regretting it, but with hope and expectation. A good friend of mine, uh, a United Church minister, said, you know, you Anglicans, you, you have terrific prayers, but you don't believe them. He says, you open your liturgy with Almighty God unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. And you spend all your time trying to pretend that God doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> and you end your Eucharist with glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. And you go out wringing your hands because you're not sure what's going to come next. Let's hold on to those two great prayers. That God who has called us into being, God who has formed us and shaped us and called us into his family is going to continue to use us for his glory. And how are we going to move forward with hope, with courage, with urgency? to respond faithfully to God's call. So the next few sessions we'll be talking about that in specific, looking at some of the um, things that are happening, how we are responding already in the Diocese of Toronto, but beginning the creative juices to say, what could we be doing? What more can we be doing to respond faithfully to God's call to us? I'm standing between you and happy hour. So I'm going to stop. <laughs> the spirit is calling. And sometimes even the flesh is weak. But I want to end with a prayer again that for me, 
has been a, is a touchstone and expresses a lot of what my, a lot of where I have faith and hope. If nothing else as leaders, you are called to proclaim truth, but to proclaim hope. In a world that is anxious and fearful, the, that old triumvirate of faith, hope, and charity, uh, the greatest of them all is charity, I think is actually needing to be rewritten today because I think today the greatest need is for hope. Let us pray. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.